Boy, you need to <clears throat> redefine holy after you hear a song like that. Holy means there's nothing quite like it. It doesn't compare to anything. One of the difficulties is we try to make God like everything else, and He's not. That's what makes Him God and uh, uh, just holy. And then He calls us holy because once you've been born again, redeemed, there's nothing like a, a saved Christian, nothing like us on the earth, nothing that belongs to God. Everything else is lost to Him except those who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So that makes you sacred, set apart, unlike anything else. And that's why we're supposed to live like that. Now, we can argue about what that looks like, but holy ought to look different. And uh, that's, that's a big discussion for another day. <laughs> All right, that's not tonight's discussion. I, I was thinking the uh, Don McIlvain, when he first called about coming here, when he was on his way to Mongolia, uh, the reason he actually came to our church, not just because he was from the state of West Virginia, but actually he got called to preach, to be in the ministry at Child Evangelism Fellowship Camp under the leadership of uh, Larry and Luana Craig. And he shared that with me. And years ago when they were running, was it called the Valley of Decision, wasn't it? Yeah, it's been so long ago. <laughs> but uh, he was there at their camp several trainings in a row, and God called him into the ministry. And then he married, and he's been out in the ministry. But that happened at a ministry that was great, that really was greatly influenced uh, by this church and by the Craigs. And so I didn't know you. I probably mentioned that way back then, but uh, just a reminder that uh, you just never know who you're influencing for the Lord. And uh, that's why the devil just really, you, you think, man, preacher, why does it seem so hard? Because the devil knows how powerful our influence is. And so he's trying to get us off of being, he can't take away our salvation. All he can do is take away our fruitfulness and our influence. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, real, or Matthew, I'm sorry. Yeah, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we'll read verses 9 through 13 there. The model prayer. Now, most people can quote the model prayer by the time we're done with this study. We should be able to just because we've read it uh, quite a few times. But since I gave you the morning off, I'm going to let you stand tonight just to get that extra exercise in. And uh, we're going to read this and, and get into a couple of protocols here in prayer. And we just have a couple more of these messages, and we'll be done with kind of this series of, of looking at prayer. But verse 9, uh, Jesus speaking, and again, we call it the model prayer. Some call it the Lord's Prayer. I believe the Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17. He literally prays for His believers and those who will come after, uh, believing because of their preaching. But He says here in verse 9, He says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And verse 10 really is our focus for our first protocol tonight. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And you know the Bible tells us that his kingdom, uh, I, there is going to be a kingdom one day where we rule with Jesus. And right here I'd get a good amen from Wayne Ash if he was here. Amen. <laughs> uh, we all know uh, that. But the reality is there's also a kingdom that comes within our hearts. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you allow God to become your king. You have a whole new set of laws. You have a whole new uh, uh, leader in your life and so on. So you don't have to wait till you meet Jesus for the kingdom of God to rule. But there is a time where that's going to come. But here he's talking about uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, meaning let God have his way. Then he says in verse number 11, give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors <clears throat> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And he didn't mean for us just to get up and repeat those words uh, aimlessly, which has happened a lot. He means that each one of these things represents something, and we're looking at a, another one of the protocols uh, that come out of verse number 10 tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, Lord, just your people. We thank you for the tools and facilities you've given us here, uh, but God, help us to be your church in the truest sense, Lord. Uh, the Bible says where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them, and whatsoever we ask in your name according to your will, that, Lord, you'll do it, and that's the kind of power we need right now. Uh, in our lives and uh, in our ministry and in our nation. And so we pray, God, that you would uh, just help us to learn about this issue of prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Maybe see that we talked about, uh, you know, we've, we've mentioned it week after week. Uh, prayer should be private, verses 5 and 6, before he gets into the model prayer. He says, don't be like the hypocrites that stand out there and pray great prayers for to be heard, but go into your closet, show, cl close the door behind you, and what you pray in secret, God will uh, reward you openly. In other words, people are going to be saying, why, why, is, why is everything always going right for their family, their prayer closet? Why, why, why are they always getting healed or getting blessed to prayer class? And that doesn't always happen. Let me tell you something. There's some pretty powerful uh, people in the scriptures that serve God. Uh, everything didn't get fixed in their life. 
But many times God does move and does answer prayer. But many times our prayer closet is pretty empty and the light is pretty dim in there. And it explains why there's a lack of God's manifestation in some of our lives. Uh, so we should be a prayer. There's a time when prayer should be private. Now, again, we've talked about public prayer and, and, and God answering prayer when we meet together and all those things. But there has to be in the Christian's life, if they're going to be a solid Christian that's going to make it through the long term journey of the Christian life, there better be a personal private prayer time developed in their personal life. Secondly, prayer should be persistent. And twice in the book of Luke, in Luke 11, you have the friend at midnight. And because of his importunity, he just went begging and begging and begging. Chapter 18, you have the widow woman and the wicked judge. And he didn't fear God or regard man, but because of her uh, persistence, he gave what they want. And God simply says, I just want you to be persistent. You don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be persistent. You do have to pray. And he said those are two key things. And then prayer has some protocols, and that's what verses 9 through 13 have been dealing with in the model prayer. And protocols are official procedures or systems of rules governing affairs of state or diplomatic occasions. In other words, if there are rules in how you step before a queen or you step before a president, uh, there are, ought to be some protocols to how you step before the, uh, to the king of kings and lord of lords and the creator of all the universe. The word sovereign means reigns over all. He's the ultimate king. He's the ultimate leader. He's the ultimate statesman. And we, in our condition, should not feel like we can just uh, saunter into his presence without any preparation if we truly want to enter properly. And we talked about fatherhood, our Father which art in heaven, reverence, uh, hallowed be thy name, cleansing, gratitude, praise, faith, kingdom, humility, tenderheartedness, and listening. We talked about, uh, I believe, last Sunday night. And so that's 10 of the 18 protocols. Tonight we're going to cover two more, Lord willing. And the next one after the listening protocol is the surrender protocol. And surrender is a big part of the Christian life. In fact, I think uh, we've said it many times, nobody can live the Christian life. Only Christ can live it through you. We don't need to be, to, to be trying harder or to be stronger. We need to be surrendering more and letting God manifest himself through us living his Christian life. If we'll just day by day die to self, take up our cross, and in obedience walk with him, Jesus Christ will be seen in our life. But we keep trying to pick ourselves up, if you will, by our bootstraps. We, we have a lot of bootstrap religion, a lot of bootstrap Christianity. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And we try and we do good for a while, but the devil knows exactly how to throw you off your game. He knows exactly how to frustrate you. He knows exactly what bothers you more than it bothers somebody else. And so what we need to do is surrender and let the, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit live his life through us. That's what surrender is all about. So we're talking about surrender. And verse 10 says, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as is in heaven. And basically the surrender is, Lord, we want your will. See, a lot of times people's idea of prayer is this is how I get God to do what I want. Sounds like a, revol a role reversal here. Whose will are we trying? Is a prayer closet about our will or God's will? And sometimes we come with requests and sometimes we come with intercession, but we're supposed to be prepared in the protocol, first of all, to say, God, I want to be praying within your will. Hey, listen, that person slighted me and didn't shake my hand. I want you just to crush that church. I want that pastor didn't shake my hand. I want his ministry to fail. I mean, you can pray a lot of prayers. It would be hard for God to really get on board with. I mean, you could pray for the Atlanta Braves to win the World Series. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you have somebody else that you're, you're you know, who, 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 do, who does God cheer for? And, and so you wonder sometimes, you know, a farmer's praying for rain and, and, and a ball team is praying for sunshine so they can play a ball game. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. But sometimes our prayers are just without question, not the will of God. They get selfish. They get vindictive. Uh, we get caught up in a moment. And so this thing about God's will, surrender, surrendering our personal desires and agendas to the Lord in exchange for our Father's plan and purpose. Jesus teaches us to pray that the Father's will would be executed on earth as in heaven. Listen, in heaven you assume that God's in charge. And he's saying our prayer should be God we live in, uh, in a broken and a fallen world, but as much as is possible, could you be in charge down here in our home? God, could you be ch in charge down here in our church services? Could you be in charge down here during our protest season in America? Don't, God, don't let me compromise. Don't let me believe a false narrative. But God, don't let me ignore if I need to search my heart and know some attitudes. It's amazing how quiet that you just gets when you mention that because the reality is, folks, there are some things we're uncomfortable with. 
And I don't believe that we ought to follow a false narrative, but at the same time, I don't believe we ought to just excuse ourselves. And so this is about God's will. You always hear this in counseling uh, with married couples or when you're dealing with parents and children. There's always what he said, what she said, and what God knows. And there's always what the mom and dad say and what the kids say and what God knows. And so even in our country, there's what one group says and what another group says and what God knows. And if it's his will, not our will, we have to be very careful to be willing to search our own hearts. It's easy to search the hearts of others. It's hard to be able to search our own hearts. And the the redeemed have the privilege of cooperating with the Godhead in implementing his agenda through prayer. See, once we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our prayers are going to reflect that maturity, and we're suddenly going to be cooperating with God in trying to get his kingdom work done. Some believers downplay the privilege of being able to partner with God for God's will to be done, and they embrace things like fatalism. Fatalism is a, uh, a faith-stripping doctrine that robs many believers of the incentive to pray. In other words, things are just going to happen the way they're going to happen, and what I pray about and, and how I feel about it and, and my fasting and, and, and my begging doesn't mean a thing. If that be true, there's a lot of Scripture that seems to be a false narrative. There's also the theology of determinism, which holds to the notion that everything that happens is the will of God, and and that will will be no matter what we think. Uh, I remember a missionary telling the story one time. He was on a uh, he was in a small canoe with a bunch of folks in a in a tribal situation, and and a baby fell out of the canoe, a little small baby that couldn't swim into the water, and he just out of impulse uh, reached out, grabbed the baby, and pulled the baby in and saved its life. And expecting people would be proud of him, everybody looked at him uh, with malice because he had just interfered with fate. And I think there's some Americans that act like that. You know, I'm just going to sit here and let everything happen in life. And you can't control everything that happens. And, and, and the reality is holding on to these ideologies while ignoring the balancing scriptures. Here's the reality. There is some reality to the fact that God is sovereign. There are some things that are going to happen because God said they're going to happen and nothing's going to change that. But there's a balance of scriptures uh, that sometimes have to understand that faith and expectancy and prayer is still a part of the teaching of the word of God. And so we can partner with God for his will to be done. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But not everybody's going to get saved. Not even God himself is going to make you get saved if you don't want to get saved. But the reality is sometimes our prayers can have an influence and an impact on revival coming and and lives being changed if we'll get in the partnership, if you will. The recorded prayers and promises throughout the Bible bear witness to God aligning himself with the prayerful utterances of his church as they align themselves with his will. There's a lot of praying that's not aligned with the will. But when we're begging God for things that God already wants, it's much easier for him to grant those things. See, I think God wants to bless every church. Every church is not blessed. Does that mean every church is living in open and wicked sin? No, but I believe a lot of churches are not willing to completely surrender their will to the will of God. And it's such an issue, you know, he says, comparing yourselves among yourselves, you're not wise. Because you know what? We look at Bible Baptist Temple and say, man, look at our facilities. Man, man, look at the people that are coming and, and the technology, and, and we, we got a lot more stuff than some smaller churches do, and, and our, our finances are doing it, and we can get very comfortable. Therefore, we don't see the need to beg God for the souls of men. We don't see the need to beg God for more because we're doing all right. But the reality is God desires every church to be on fire. God desires for there to be a great moving in every song service, in every invitation time, But that does not happen until we get to the place where we surrender and say, God, listen, we're we're pretty comfortable with just, you know, if our kids can stay off of drugs and not get pregnant before they get married, and and if they'll just be work hard and have a work ethic, and and we kind of said, and God says, oh, no, no, I want you to go farther. But we have to be willing to surrender to God's will to pray. Prayer is not passive resignation or capitulation to the inevitable. You know, sometimes we pray, we say, well, just pray, but, you know, God's will is going to be done. No, he asks us to ask for amazing things. He says to come boldly and to, to receive mercy and to obtain grace to help in the time of need and ask God for things. And, and God is in, in, in the business of answering prayer and astonishing people if we'll believe. 
Now, he's not going to answer prayer. Sometimes God takes the life of somebody you begged him not to because it's in some grand design greater than we understand. But how many times has God kept somebody going, protected? I know people's days are numbered, and I don't know how often you can pray and add days to somebody's life. But I know he tells us to pray, and so I pray uh, for people to be healed that are sick. I pray for people to get over cancer so they'll live a little bit longer. Uh, I realize in the end, everybody's going to step out into eternity, but if they can just get a few more years with their family, why not? But, you know, the faith healer's idea, you know, why do faith healers wear glasses? If you can just heal everything all the time and control God like that, uh, you know, and so there's a balance to both of those things. But we need to pray and need to believe God. We need to get involved. It's not a passive resignation and capitulation. And, and sometimes, uh, and we need to be careful to pray according to God's will, but sometimes we'll pray for something miraculous and say, if it be your will, because we're afraid if it doesn't happen, it'll shake our faith. You should pray and say, God, I, I would like this to happen. I, I'm not going to argue with about it. You know better than I do, but this is what I'm asking for. And then just see what God might do. But again, if your heart is turned towards it, if you're surrendered to him, you're going to be amazed at how much your prayers are not going to be selfish and how much your prayers are not going to be rooted in, in, in just physical blessings, but are going to be rooted in spiritual blessings and spiritual outcomes. One of the goals in prayer is to implement God's will on earth. God allows us to enter into his desires. He gives us prayer burdens. It's amazing sometimes I'll be praying, and man, suddenly somebody will come to my mind, somebody will come to my heart, and you've heard the stories. Missionaries talking about being out in the village, and, 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 and chiefs will come and talk to them later and say, we had you surrounded, and we were going to attack you, but there were all these men standing around protecting you. They're like, what, man? I was by myself, and somehow God put angels standing around, and they come back home on furlough, and somebody says, this time, this night, uh, God woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I prayed for you. I mean, God gives you prayer burdens. God begins to stir in your heart, begins to put you in a direction. As our wills unite with His, we pray the things in God's heart into existence. See, there's things God would desire to have, but they're not, even God Himself can't get it done without us. I mean, there were taxes to be paid, and a fish had to go swallow a coin somewhere so that the Son of God could pay His taxes. And, you know, animals tend to, to believe. A raven had to feed one of his prophets for a while. So if God is going to, a donkey had to talk. So why, don't you think God uses us to accomplish his will here on this earth? And so in surrendering and seeking his will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven, we have to pray and get in line and united with him. And as we pray for it and he desires it, then through his power he can see it done. Jesus prayed saying in Luke chapter 22, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Even Jesus Christ in his human form said, if there's any other way, if there's any other way to deal with man's brokenness, any other way to deal with man's separation from us, any other way to deal with the fact that man has been estranged from us, than me going and dying on a cross and taking, it wasn't just simply the humiliation physically. It wasn't, I don't even believe it was the pain. It was the separation from his father for the first time in all of eternity to taste of the horribleness of every wicked thought and every evil deed that mankind could ever think of that Jesus was going to have to take on that cross. He said, God, if, he said, Father, if there's any other way if, 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 if keeping the Ten Commandments can do it, God, let's go there. If, if, if doing better than my neighbor can do it, let's go there. Jesus said, man, I don't want in my human form, I don't want to go to the cross. And I don't want to become sin. And I don't want to be separated from you. And I don't want to taste of hell's flame. If it's at all possible, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. You know, so much of our praying is about God, uh, make me happy and keep my circumstances good and keep my family healthy. But, but at some point we have to say, Lord, this, I don't want to suffer loss. I don't want to live without my mate. I don't want to have a, 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 a crippling disease. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It's, it, it's a serious business to say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What price are we truly willing to pay for God's glory and for God's will to be done. Because we're all for God's will being done if that means He wants to bless us or bless our church or, or bless our special day. 
pondering the cup of his father's fierce wrath against fallen man's sin deeply troubled Jesus. He says again in Luke twenty two forty four, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, do you know what he accomplished in those three episodes where he leaves his disciples who are falling asleep, and he goes and he spends some time in agonizing prayer with God? You know what he's accomplishing? He's not accomplishing getting God to line up with his desire. He's getting his own heart and his own humanity as a man God to line up with God's will. See, prayer is as much about getting us to line up with God as it is about getting God. Yeah, we, we want to make our plans and then ask God to bless them. And God understands that true prayer, the right protocol prayer of surrender, will get us to line up with what God's trying to do. When the sinless Savior anticipated drinking the divine wrath for all mankind, he first had to come to grips with the agony of the cross. But Jesus died to his will in Gethsemane before his body died on Calvary. When we pray, we're not asking God to alter reality to adapt to our felt needs. God-focused prayer puts the priority on God's name, God's kingdom, and God's will first. Prayer is not about getting our will done in heaven. It's about getting God's will fulfilled on earth. See, we always pray, God's will, we want want God to say, now up there in heaven, everybody wants what I want. No, down here on earth, we're supposed to want what God wants. Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he was, he was persecuting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, and he fell to the earth. God meets him there on the road, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? His first prayer of recognition. See, salvation should be a prayer of surrender. God, I can't save myself. I want you to be the Lord of my life. But you know what we've sold it at? We've sold it as a ticket, free free ride to heaven. And somehow we still get to be in control. We just get to collect heaven at the end of us being in control. Paul said from the beginning, Lord, what would you have me to do? And from that point, point forward, he was saved, but he belonged to God. And he started out with surrender And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to a city, and it will be told thee what you must do. And Paul began his spiritual journey with a prayer of surrender. In order to truly pray, we must hoist the white flag of surrender to Christ's lordship. This precedes asking for provision. Our daily bread comes later, but first there must be surrender. It's it's before our, our prayer for pardon because forgiveness of our sins as we forgive others comes later. And protection, deliverance from evil comes later. This prayer of surrender precedes provision, pardon, and protection. We must surrender our hurt, pain, worry, doubt, fear, and anxiety, asking our Father to wash us clean. Self must be lost in the vision of God in order for effective prayer to take place. To say yes to God, we must first say no to ourselves. And that's a hard part of prayer. You know, when the mechanic aligns the tires of an automobile, he does not align the frame to the tires. So strange. Why, why would you take the frame, metal frame, and bend it to the rubber tires? So what you do is you take those four or those two front rubber tires and you align them to the frame. And you know, often in our Christian life, we are trying to align God to us instead of aligning us to God. And many of us, are, are, our spiritual tires are worn unevenly because we've never got lined up with God. And we have blowouts because we're not in line. Self-will, self-seeking, self-sufficiency, and self-glory must be renounced. Elizabeth Elliot, who lost her husband uh, to, to missionary service, said, The will of God is not something to add to your life. It is a course you choose. You either line yourself up with the Son of God, or you capitulate to the principles which governs the rest of the world. A lot of Christians are living by the world's view rather than God's view. There's a biblical worldview and there is a human worldview. Which view are we lining up with? Surrendering to the will of God is not a one-time act. It should become a way of life. Someone said, let me live so that if somebody wrote my life story, it would be more about God than about me. 
God's will is often clearly revealed in God's word. The phrase will of God is found 23 times in the Bible. Well, Lord, preacher, how do you know the will of God? I know it's hard sometimes, career. I know it's hard sometimes uh, where to go to college and things like that. But so much, 23 times, it's very clear. Uh, examples like that, we be morally pure is the will of God. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God. Pretty easy. This is the will of God. What is what God? Even your sanctification, that's being set apart, not being like the rest of the world, living unto God, that ye should abstain from fornication all immorality. It's the will of God. We shouldn't be doing anything, whether it's entertainment whether it's dress, whether it's activities or thought life that would lean towards any kind of immorality. That we give thanks, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That we live spirit-filled lives, Ephesians 5.17 and 18, wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit that all men should uh, come to repentance, Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. So the will of God appears many times in the Scripture, but in order for us to truly pray as God intends for us to pray, we must surrender that His will that's in heaven be done here on earth. Just like in heaven, he's in charge. He needs to be in charge in our hearts, in our lives, in our ministries, in, in our church, in our services. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the next one, we'll go quickly through this one. That is the surrender protocol. This one is one our church just loves. Every time I preach about it, everybody smiles, claps, sometimes standing ovations when I preach on this. It's the singing protocol. The singing protocol. Psalms 100 verses 1 and 2 said, Make a joyful noise in the Lord. We've joked about that. People who can't carry a tune in a bucket and people that can't seemingly sing. And we talk about that. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Listen to this. <clears throat> Come before His presence with singing. People say to me all the time, Well, I'm just not a singer. Well, you know, sometimes I'm just not a soul winner, but I'm still supposed to share my faith. Sometimes I'm not even a good husband. I'm still supposed to love my wife. You know, it's, it's amazing. God said, come before my presence. We'll sing. Well, I just say, God says, learn to sing. My Holy Spirit will sing if you won't sing. There's, so, so, there's got to be some way to get you to sing because it's a protocol, and it's not just mentioned a few times in the Bible that we should be singing in the presence of Almighty God. There's a reason church services begin with singing. Singing conveys the idea of shouting for joy. It literally means to sound the glad voice of triumph. And we don't, you know, we, let's face it, we're singing, we're thinking about what's next, we're writing down our, uh, uh, our, our recipe for a meal. I mean, we're, we're supposed to be singing, we're supposed to be, uh, uh, supposed to have the sound of a glad voice of triumph. If we, I'll tell you what, we, even if our preaching dies out, if we just get our singing right, we pick something up from church. Now, hopefully the preaching will stay well too, but sometimes our song service doesn't give us anything. God says that men are to approach him with singing. He wants us to come to him with rejoicing, celebration, shout, a shout of praise. The entire, uh, there's an entire book in the Bible dedicated to singing or psalms. We know that the book of psalms in the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament hymn book. It contains 150 psalms or songs. One of them states in Psalms 95 verse 2, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms or songs or singing. The phrase joyful noise means to split the ear or shout for joy. Some of us can split an ear a lot better than some of the rest of us can. <laughs> Unfortunately, in many churches, the only shouting that happens is in the business meeting. Yeah. Some have said that uh, God has given us three things to refresh the soul. One is nature. People go to the beach, to the mountains to recharge. Nature has a way of readjusting our attitude. And, you know, just go for a walk. Just get outside. Get in the sunshine. There, there, there's a refreshing that nature brings to us. Secondly is friendship. It's also a tonic for weary souls. Companionship is refreshing and can encourage us. But the third one is music. And music can do damage, but music can do well. Good. It has an amazing ability to lift us up. An exhilarating song elevates the sinking soul. Listen, they'll play a march song to get you through the uh, fast food restaurant quicker so they can sell more food. David's heart playing drove the evil spirit from King Saul. 
1 Samuel 16, 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hands. So Saul was refreshed and, and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Music has the capacity to liberate and to revitalize our soul. By the same token, music has the ability to put very negative thoughts and emotions and spiritual things into your life. We must sing from our hearts to the Lord. Colossians 3.16 instructs us to sing to the Lord, not just about the Lord. We do a lot of singing about our theology rather than singing to it. And you know what? There's, there's a group of people that kind of moved away from doctrine and just started singing a lot. And so we got to the point, just like we got away from the Holy Spirit because some people overdid that. And so now we, we think if you sing a song that seems like it's to God, so you can sing about God, but don't sing to God. Now, wait a minute. Let's test the scripture and see about that. Because it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So don't give up the preaching and don't give up the teaching of the word of Christ. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's very easy for a choir to sing to the people. It's very easy for a choir to sing to each other. But a choir ought to get up there, smile, and just sing to Jesus and not care what anybody thinks about it. It makes a difference. And a congregation ought to sing to the Lord, not to each other. The spirit of music and the person leading the congregation music uh, uh, is as important as the style of music. Sometimes we talk about this style of music, that style of music. Listen, you, you, you can make any music dead music. And you can make a lot of music that's called dead music alive with the right spirit and the right enthusiasm and attitude. A dull, a dull song service dishonors the spirit of worship and praise. It's an insult to God's glory. Singing at church is not a filler, something to do to take up time, nor is it meant to be a platform for human talent. I was told many years ago when I first came, or somebody told me, I'm the best singer you've got in this church. Well, that's between you and God, but, you know, it's really about the heart, not about your talent. I don't know if it was true to start with, but even if it was true, not quite what you want to say <laughs> to the pastor. Actually, uh, you know, uh, you're going to have to forgive me here because I'm going off the rails. Sunday evening, August the 30th, and we put this in the calendar last year before everything went crazy. But, but Lord willing, Sunday evening, August 30th, at 6 o'clock, we're, we're going to try to have a singspiration. Oh, Baptist church. Heaven. Now, see, inspirations were things where people of all kinds of doctrines would come together on a fifth Sunday and didn't care what you taught or preached. I have an issue with that because if I'm seen hanging out with people and on the platform with people that are teaching that salvation is through baptism, I'm going to confuse some people. So I, I'm not, music does not trump doctrine. But there's nothing wrong with our church or churches of like faith getting together and just singing and praising Jesus. But a lot of people want to sing without any preaching. But we've gotten to the point where we preach and 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 we're really missing praise. So we're going to start to try to praise a little on August 30th to make up for all the preach and preach and preach and preach. We can get stuck in a rut pretty quick. It is God's chosen means for us to enter His presence and worship Him. Churches today desperately need Spirit-filled people to lead believers in Spirit-filled worship. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Somebody raises their hand. No liberty. Now, I understand people can get pretty crazy with liberty. You know, bring your blanket so you can throw it on the ladies when they fall down and kick their legs up in the air. I'm like, but man, let's, let's, can't we enjoy Jesus? If those leading are in, enjoying the songs, it gives permission to the congregation to enjoy the worship also. Music can never replace preaching, but it is vitally important to the atmosphere, atmosphere and spirit of preaching. I think it's uh, uh, the college there uh, where Ron Comfort is. They always said that preaching is king and music is queen. And the queen kind of sets up the house for the king. Music should be a tool in our personal devotions. It prepares our heart to read the Word of God, and to pray. And if we lack musical ability, and, you know, some of us, we can just go down the road just singing with our windows, you know, up and nobody cares. But if you really lack musical ability, technology allows us to spend time listening to good music 
during devotional times, we can listen to good music. That's why it's so important to figure out what really is music that's motivating you spiritually and music that's motivating you physically and emotionally. Because you can spend hours and hours listening to music that gets you all hyped up and does nothing for your walk and praise for God. And so it is important, the type of music. Praise, somebody said, is faith set to music. Praise is faith set to music. So we, I, I understand there's some extremes, but I'm telling you what, it's it, it, extreme to one direction and then extreme to the other direction. Both of them, opposite directions, are dysfunctional. Somewhere in the middle is functional. We should be able to praise the Lord. The singing protocol, to sing to the Lord, about the Lord, for the Lord, to make a joyful noise. So the surrender protocol Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's about us lining up with his will, not lining him up with our will. The singing protocol, Psalms 101 and 2, make a joyful noise on the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. What are we singing? Praising the Lord. Listen, if we would praise the Lord, the world wouldn't be able to jerk our chain so easily. There's just a lot of frustrated Christians, you know, because we're conservatives, and when you're conservative, Bible-believing, I mean, you tend to be conservative. When you're a conservative, they just have a way of just setting you on the edge. Because when you're a liberal, you can just agree with everything. When you're a conservative, you're, you stand for things. And when you stand for things, you get frustrated. It means something to you. A liberal, they don't care. You know, I don't care as long as you do your thing, I'll do mine. But a conservative says, man, these things are important to me. And things become so important, if we're not careful, we have no praise and no joy. Because we're so busy defending our position that we have no joy in just praising our Savior. So praise your Savior while you're defending your position. Don't be a grumpy Christian. There's enough grumpiness. People aren't really excited when we invite them to come join our grumpy movement. <laughs> but if we invite them to join a movement that has the joy of the Lord that says, I'm, just, I'm not going to compromise truth. Man, when you smile at somebody, when you tell them, no, I'm not going to go along with you, they don't know what to do with you. But if you frown and grump and complain, they got you pegged. Just one of them grumpy old conservatives. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We've got our eyes on way too many things. The surrender protocol, the singing protocol. Let's stand together. And just, again, prayer is it's a daily choice. Daily time with the Lord. It should be, there should be some private prayer, persistent prayer, and there are some prayer protocols which include surrendering in our prayers, getting lined up with God, and also singing, coming before His presence with singing.